today's State Department news briefing, which deals with human rights conditions around the world. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure for me today to have the simple chore of introducing our two briefers who are going to discuss the 1993 uh, Human Rights Reports in summary, copies of which I see many of you have. I'd like to introduce our two briefers, starting with uh, Councillor Tim Worth, who the Secretary described today as being very much the point man in the Department's whole effort uh, to assemble this report and to continue to press human rights issues in, in all of our diplomatic relations as we work overseas. Uh, he will be accompanied by Assistant Secretary for Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs, John Shattuck, who I think many of you know and who has been uh, available on many occasions here to talk through some of the issues that uh, arise and as we promote our human rights concerns uh, globally. Tim. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. I'm, as Mike pointed out, Tim Worth, Counselor to the Department, and John Shattuck, the uh, Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs, will follow me with a little more detailed uh, discussion of the report, uh, some highlights, and then we will open up for questions. Uh, we have invited you here today, and you are all here, uh, related to the release of the State Department's annual report to Congress on human rights practices. I should remind all of you that this uh, is required of the Department of State, that uh, in the Foreign Assistance Act of 1974, the Secretary of State shall transmit to the Speaker of the House and the Committee on Foreign Relations of the Senate by January 31 each year a full and complete report regarding the status of internationally recognized human rights within the meaning of subsection A, which means in countries that received assistance under this part and in all other foreign countries which are members of the United Nations and which are not otherwise the subject of a human rights report under this act. This is an annual report that goes up required by uh, the Congress. What I'd like to do is to give you a few broad themes as to how this fits into where we are uh, and then turn it over to John. Uh, President Clinton and Secretary Christopher have clearly underlined human rights and the promotion of democracy as fundamental to our foreign policy. By fostering pluralism and democracy around the world, we lay the foundation for political stability, economic progress, and environmental protection. By working to assure that governments respect the rights of their citizens, we help to safeguard international peace and security. This has been an eventful year. In June, 182 nations gathered at the World Conference on Human Rights in Vienna. After a fitful beginning, highlighted by the refusal to allow the Dalai Lama into the hall, I think it's fair to say that our steady hand prevailed. With interventions from former President Carter and from Secretary Christopher, the conference proved a success. The Vienna Declaration and Program of Action reaffirmed the universality of human rights. It recognized that human rights are a legitimate concern of the international community, refused to recognize so-called cultural differences or various economic excuses, and proposed steps to strengthen the UN's human rights machinery. Building on the Vienna Declaration, the United Nations General Assembly then authorized creation of the post of High Commissioner for Human Rights, a high priority goal of the United States of America. The High Commissioner will provide the international community with a spokesperson for the promotion and protection of human rights around the world. The High Commissioner will also make a practical difference overseeing UN human rights bodies and supervising UN human rights programs. <clears throat> the High Commissioner will assume responsibility for human rights issues in UN peacekeeping, peacemaking, and humanitarian assistance operations. Press reports indicate that UN Secretary Boutros Ghali will appoint former Ecuadorian Foreign Minister Jose Ayala Lasso to this important post. Ayala Lasso, as you know, chaired the UNGA Working Group, which hammered out the resolution establishing the post of High Commissioner. Despite the successes of 1993, much remains to be done. Armed conflicts continue to be linked to human rights abuses throughout the world. Armed insurgent groups, as well as governments, violate the rights of individual citizens and use humanitarian assistance as a weapon of war. Ethnic, racial, and religious conflict illustrate the dangers, and we're only too conscious of the continuum from human rights abuse to eroded respect for minority groups to ethnic cleansing. This awareness further underscores our resolve. We have placed increased emphasis this year in the report and in our policies on the protection of the rights of women, including issues such as rape, 
female genital mutilation, treatment of women in the workplace, marginalization of women in the political process, and the rights of women to freely and responsibly choose the number and spacing of their children. Governments themselves create a climate for abuse when they refuse to investigate and prosecute those accused of human rights abuses. By inaction, governments undercut their own legitimacy. The international community is acting, and in the case of the former Yugoslavia, has recognized that those accused of human rights abuses must be made to face the consequences through the establishment by the United Nations of the International War Crimes Tribunal. We have been strong advocates for this process, and while frustrated by the slow timetable, continue to press ahead. Are we making progress? Of course we are. We've seen human rights become a major issue in the relations between nations, largely because of the efforts of the United States of America. As John will report, even China is moving a little, and we will press for more. Efforts by Nelson Mandela and F.W. de Klerk, by Itzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat, by the people of Cambodia and the former Soviet Union, confirm the purpose of our commitment. And we will continue to press forward on individual cases to promote conflict resolution, to advocate self-fulfillment for individuals, and to promote democracy and the rule of law. This broadened commitment by the Clinton administration, starting with the president and flowing through our reorganized efforts here in the State Department, results in this strengthened and more comprehensive report. It is now my pleasure to uh, introduce John Shattuck, the Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs. John. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to cover for you uh, six major trends that are evident from the 1993 reports uh, and uh, to give you an opportunity then to ask us some questions about uh, each of those issues and other issues that may be in the reports that you want to cover. First, and perhaps uh, most powerfully in 1993, we see the trend of ethnic, racial, and religious armed conflict, often stimulated by abusive and irresponsible political leaders who play on people's fears which has once again proved to be a cauldron of major human rights abuse. In Bosnia, Sudan, Burundi, Somalia, Angola, Iraq, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and elsewhere, armed conflict led to massive numbers of civilian deaths, refugee flows, and major human rights abuses and war crimes, such as the cynical use of rape as an instrument of so-called ethnic cleansing in Bosnia. The second trend is in the opposite direction. Dramatic first steps toward reconciliation in parts of the world where it once seemed impossible. The Middle East, South Africa, and Cambodia, as Tim Worth pointed out, as well as El Salvador, where a UN Truth Commission completed its investigations of major human rights violations of the past decade and recommended specific actions to further the reconciliation process. In the third trend that we highlight in 1993, democracy continued to fire the imagination of people around the world. There were both major setbacks and major advances. The process of democracy moved forward in Cambodia, where successful elections were held, but backward in Haiti, where the military continued to obstruct the return of President Aristide. Advances occurred in Russia, where democratic parliamentary elections were held for the second time in the country's history, as well as in certain Latin American countries. But there were also major setbacks in countries such as Nigeria, Burundi, and others. The fourth trend was a continuation of major human rights abuses in certain parts of the world, where no necessarily armed conflict is occurring, but nonetheless the abuses continue. Of particular concern for us in 1993 and reflected in the reports were torture, arbitrary detention, impunity for per perpetrators of abuse, as well as actions trampling on rights of women, children, indigenous people, and workers in too many countries. Different aspects of these problems were evident in varying degrees in a variety of countries with different forms of government, such as China, Iran, Iraq, North Korea, Libya, Burma, Zaire, Cuba, Indonesia, India, Saudi Arabia, Peru, Egypt, and Turkey, as well as others. A fifth trend was more positive. Countries working together in the UN, the Conference of Security and Cooperation in Europe, 
the Organization of American States, and the Organization of African Unity supported new democracies, mediated conflicts, or took steps to begin to hold each other accountable for human rights abuses. The successful World Conference on Human Rights, which Tim Worth referred to, followed by the establishment of a UN High Commissioner for Human Rights late in 1993 and the creation of a Yugoslav War Crimes Tribunal, which began its work this month, are significant markers of this trend. Finally, the most powerful underlying trend, which our report reflects for 1993, is the continuing growth of a grassroots movement throughout the world to promote human rights and democracy. Human rights cannot be protected without constant vigilance of courageous individuals and non-governmental organizations who document abuses and hold their governments to account. Let us get into any uh, questions now that you all may have, please. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, to follow up on something you said, you said that this report strengthens previous reports. It, it, is strengthen, it is a strengthened and more comprehensive report. What are you saying about previous reports by previous administrations when you say that this one is strengthened? How is it different? Well, I think this has been an evolving process. Uh, starting in 1977, the first report was uh, Effort was led by then Deputy Secretary Christopher. We reported at that point on some 83 countries, and I think we're now at 180 uh, countries in this report. Uh, strengthened in the breadth of the report, uh, we focused for the first time with a major section on women. Uh, that has not happened before. I think that we have come uh, to the very clear understanding, and it is a very high priority of this administration of the role of women as it relates to so many of the priorities of the administration, running across from human rights. Most refugees, as we know, are women and children. The people f most impacted by environmental degradation and toxics uh, tend to be women closest to the ground. Uh, the issues of women and population and reproductive health are closely related. That is a very high priority of this administration and is uh, clearly outlined. Uh, we have in this report uh, put a greater emphasis than before on the rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, clearly we have a long way to go around the world, but we have attempted to uh, illustrate that uh, more clearly and more prominently than in the past, and we'll continue uh, to make those efforts. Since this, uh, since this report is linked with trade as well as aid, I wonder whether in general there are recommendations that you're going to make to support your conclusions here for any restrictions or loosening of restrictions on trade and aid for any of these countries uh, in this report? As well, those are judgments that are made on a country-by-country -country basis related to our policy in those particular countries. But yes. clearly, uh, the recommendations, as we view on a country-by-country -country basis, and China is the most visible one, uh, that uh, our conclusion is very clearly that limited progress was made in 1973. We believe that more progress has been, I mean, in 1993, more progress was made in uh, early 1994. And as uh, the President has pointed out, and uh, at recently on a number of occasions, most particularly re at the State of the Union, as the Secretary has pointed out over and over and over again, and as Secretary Benson recently pointed out, uh, much more significant progress is going to be necessary. That is a linkage of human rights and uh, trade policy that focuses very specifically on one country, but it is not uh, the purpose of this report to develop an overall trade strategy. That's not what the Congress I'm, I'm, requires. I'm not, I'm not asking that. I'm just wondering whether, since you've talked about China, whether there are any other countries that stood well, I out. I talked about China did. just because I thought your question begged the ant begged that that comment. Well, it did, but yeah. it also asked, but it also suggested the possibility that there may be relations with other countries that, according to what I've read, have worse records than China or records not as bad as China, like Vietnam, for example. Uh, the purpose of this report is to provide basic information about the human rights records of the 193 countries which are covered, and then to uh, provide a basis for developing foreign policy recommendations in a wide range of fields, the conditionality of aid, uh, the way in which uh, uh, training uh, programs are provided, affirmative assistance for democracy programs, uh, trade relations to be sure. These are all issues that are part of the uh, process that uh, these, these human rights reports address. And it is the commitment of 
Secretary Christopher, as he's made uh, very clear, uh, that the considerations of the human rights reporting process be taken very much into account as we make uh, our relationship. I'll just add one other comment on China in terms of the specifics uh, and what the report reflects. Uh, the, report, the report certainly shows a, a continuing a climate of repression of political and civil rights in China, uh, which is, uh, has been the case for a number of uh, years. And it shows uh, patterns of abuse in prisons and shows uh, difficulties for dissent in China and particular repression in Tibet. Uh, these are all issues that are part of the dialogue that the uh, United States now has with China as a part of the President's uh, overall policy of engagement on China. And they are issues uh, which uh, we believe some progress is shown in 1993, limited uh, by no means enough uh, to satisfy the conditions of overall significant progress within the executive order uh, of the president. Let me make one more comment about the China report, because I think uh, uh, there is, uh, this has been a report prepared with, uh, as well as all the other reports, with great effort to include all the information available regarding the conditions of human rights in the political and civil rights area in China. Uh, it is a report that I think accurately depicts, uh, the, as I said in my remarks before, uh, the continuing serious repression of political and civil rights throughout China and the existence of political prisoners. And it's in that area that President Clinton is uh, seeking uh, improvements in the China record. Let's go all the way over to the right here, this gentleman. Hey. The, You're going to come over here. Okay. Sorry. How do you explain uh, having fight for a, the North American Free Trade Agreement with a country like Mexico that your report describes as perpetrating outright violation of uh, electoral laws and uh, and uh, still conducting uh, widespread human rights abuses? I mean, isn't there an inconsistency there? Well, nobody's perfect. We're not perfect, nor are they, nor is anybody else. Uh, and we have certainly uh, pointed out to the government of Mexico, as we have to other governments where we think significant abuses occur and as uh, John Shattuck has pointed out this is a a report uh, that reports on well-documented facts we check this very very carefully and the Congress requires us to do that and that's what we will do as dispassionately and objectively as possible related to Mexico it has been a major uh, purpose of our foreign policy to engage the government of Mexico on trade on the environment on human rights on a whole series of issues and we believe that enormous progress has been made uh, by Mexico. Last you want to add yeah, that? Let me just add to that. Er early reporting, and as uh, Mr. Worth indicates, uh, not yet uh, fully verified, uh, do in does indicate uh, uh, some evidence of extrajudicial killings that may have occurred, uh, situations that may have involved torture. Uh, and, of course, this is all going to be reported on as the information becomes clear. One other point on Mexico is that uh, there is a, Mexico, a, a Human Rights Commission in Mexico and a, uh, a very effective, over the last several years, effort to prosecute human rights abuses by the Attorney General, uh, Mr. Carpizzo, who has now been named as the Interior Minister and has responsibility in this area.